That's no way to answer the phone, Susie. Hello, Matthew's residence. This is Jimmy. Just a minute, please. Uncle Bill, Captain Adams wants to talk to you. Thanks, Jimmy. Hi, Captain. This is Bill. No, we don't usually have ducks answer the phone. That one belongs to Susie. My niece and nephew are visiting me, and I promised to take them on a picnic. Oh? You need that poster today. If it doesn't stop, there won't be any oh, picnic. Oh, we don't... Ah! Oh. Ah! Crackle likes it, it? Yeah, it's mm. great weather for ducks. Oh, sure. Glad to do it. Bye. Captain Adams wants this poster I've done for him delivered to him at police headquarters today. I'll drop it off on our way to the park. Good thing I got that phone call. If he hadn't reached me, I wouldn't have gotten it to him on time. I never thought about that, Uncle Bill. You never thought about what? What did people do before the telephone was invented? How did they get messages to each other in a hurry? Well, while we're waiting for the rain to stop, let's see if we can find out by playing make-believe. Oh, good. That sounds like fun. Now, here's our friend. We'll call him, uh, Mr. Man. He's going to take us back thousands of years, way before telephones or televisions or Telstar. He looks a little like you, Uncle Bill. <laughs> he looks a little like all of us, Jimmy. You ready, Mr. Man? Man has played many parts during the years he has lived on Earth. So let's make believe we're going back in time. Thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago? That's right, when men lived in caves and hunted for their food. <laughs> Found a herd of buffalo. At last, meat for supper. Run and tell the others to bring weapons, or else supper will run away. The only way Mr. Caveman knew how to get a message from one place to another was to send a runner. As civilization grew, man's way of life changed. But he still used runners to send messages. The Egyptians used runners. It took two days for a Greek runner to bring the news of a great victory. He is getting tired. He discovered he could ride horses. <laughs> Romans used horses. So did the knights. That's a Pony Express rider. That's right. But man wanted to send messages faster than a runner or a horse could travel. He's sending an Indian smoke signal. Right, but only the simplest messages could be sent this way. And none at all if it rained. He learned to use flashing mirrors by daylight and blinking lights when it was dark. He couldn't send messages very far that way, could he? No, oh, Jimmy, he couldn't. But man has always been able to solve his problems by inventing new things. That's a telegraph message. Yes. About 125 years ago, Samuel Morris invented the telegraph, a way to send code messages over an electric wire. The code was made by using different clicks for each letter of the alphabet. First message sent over 40 miles of wire was, what hath God wrought? The telegraph was, and still is, wonderful. But Mr. Mann wanted to send his voice over a distance to carry on a real conversation. Then in 1876, a man named Alexander Graham Bell found a way. He invented the telephone. Hey, that's your phone, Uncle Bill. Hello, Matthew's residence. This is Jimmy. Oh, hi. hi, Mom. Hi. Yes, we got here before the rain started. Oh, Uncle Bill's gonna take us on a picnic if it lets up. Bye. We're playing make-believe. I'll tell you about it when we get home. Good. Okay, Mom. Bye. What are you doing, Susie? She wanted to hear the voice going through the wire. You can't hear voices in the wire. Well, how does it work? How'd your mother's voice get in the phone? That's simple. It... That's funny. I don't know. 
I never thought about it before. We were talking as if we were in the same room. How does the telephone work, Uncle Bill? Magic? No, not magic, Susie, but science. Science of sound waves and electricity. How do they work? We'll let Mr. Mann show us. We'll pretend now he's a musician. All sounds come from a movement of the air, back and forth, like waves. I don't see any waves. See the string move back and forth? I have seen strings and rubber bands move back and forth, but I've never seen a sound wave. Well, you can't really see them, you hear them. If you could see them, they'd look like this. Different kinds of sounds make different kinds of sound waves. A low sound makes a different wave than a high sound. Hey, Rudolph, that's the wrong note. You see, people's voices make sound waves too. When we speak, air from our lungs moves vocal cords like these in our throats. Hey, Rudolph! This movement makes sound waves and sends them out of our mouths. Hey! Hey! When sound waves reach the ear of another person, they make the drum in his ear move back and forth, and he hears the sound the other person is making. I see. But how do you hear over the telephone? And we're coming to that. When Mr. Mann speaks into the telephone, the flow of electricity in the wires makes it possible for the other person to hear what Mr. Mann is saying, just as quick as a flash. But how? Well, when he has dialed his friend, and his friend Rudolph answers, the flow of electricity in the wires connects Mr. Mann's telephone through the telephone building to his friend's phone. Oh. Rudolph. Mr. Mann's vocal cords make sound waves which go into the mouthpiece of the telephone. These sound waves make the electricity flow stronger and weaker, depending on the sound waves his voice makes. Remember now that the flow of electricity is changing from strong to weak as it comes from Mr. Mann's telephone. These changes work on the receiver very much the way sound works on your eardrum. The electricity makes a little metal plate vibrate. This vibration makes sound waves come out of the receiver. And so, in a split second, the person on the other end of the line hears the same words Mr. Mann is speaking. And what he hears sounds just like Mr. Mann's voice. Rudolph, I said that's the wrong note. Ah, uh, Susie, you shouldn't play around with the telephone. Somebody may be trying to... You see? Somebody was trying to call us. Yo, Matthews. Would you repeat that slowly, sir? Well, you must have the wrong number. What number are you calling? Well, not so loud. I'm sorry. But this is 555-3759. Five, 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 I shouldn't lose my temper, even when people roar into the telephone at me. Mm, mm, mm. Always talking, always talking. Mm, mm. It's a good thing animals don't talk on the telephone. Say, let's pretend we're at a talking animal circus. Mr. Man can be the ringmaster. Sounds like fun. There we are. May I draw his whip? Sure. Whiskers? Here. <laughs> All set, Mr. Man? Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the greatest the most sensational talking animal act the world has ever heard. Introducing the lion and the minor bird. Miss 
Myrtle Minor Bird speaking. Well, how are you? Please don't roar at me. What did the lion do wrong, Jimmy? You don't have to shout into the telephone to be heard. That's right. Just use your normal speaking voice and speak directly into the mouthpiece. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Myrtle. Presenting the impatient squirrel and the sleepy bear. Watch, Jimmy. When you dial, you should make sure you bring your finger all the way around to the finger stop. Then for each number, let the dial go all the way back by itself. Each number, all the way. Then let go. See? Yes, sir. to answer. But if you're the person making the call, you should let the phone ring eight to ten times. See? Both of them are disappointed. And now, the preposterous pachyderms. In other words, elephants. So like I said, I wanted to invite you to a party. Smarty? Who are you calling a smarty? No, no. I said I'm giving a party at my house. Mouse? Don't you call me a mouse. What is the matter, Jimmy? Hello? I know. It's important to speak clearly on the phone so the other person can understand what you're saying. Right again, Jimmy. And now, for our grand finale, the Gossipy Piggy and the fed-up fox. Well, guess who was there? Betty. Hmm? So I said to her, well, how is it every time I go to a sale, I run into you? It's just the funniest thing. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me, lady, but I've been waiting to make an important call for 25 minutes. But I simply must tell Irma about my new hat. Well, now, as I was saying before I was interrupted, it's selfish and impolite to hog the phone. Somebody may be waiting to use it, or trying to call your house. <laughs> Gee, that was fun. I hope nobody's being selfish on Bobby's phone. I'll call him to see if he's coming on the picnic. The telephone book is very helpful. Our friends are in it, like Robert Martin. Our doctor is in it. The television repairman, the bicycle shop. Then in this little book, I write down the numbers of people I call often. You should have one too, Jimmy. Saves a lot of time to keep the phone numbers of people you call often. Like your friend Bobby. Oh, yes. Hey, look, the sun's out. Now we can go on our picnic. Hooray! Ah, ah. I'll try to call Bobby again. Well, tell him to meet us in front of the police station at 2.30. That way, we can drop off the poster for Captain Adams. All right. Hello, Mrs. Martin. This is Jimmy Matthews. May I please speak to Bobby? Thank you. Hi, Bobby. Listen, we'll meet you in front of the police station at 2.30. Don't forget to bring your ball and glove.
Hi, Tom. Hi there. Children, this is Captain Adams. Hello, Captain Adams. How are you today? Fine. I want to be a policeman when I grow up. She wants to be everything when she grows up. Here's the emergency poster you wanted. Thanks. I think Jimmy and Susie would like to know how valuable the telephone is in emergencies. Good. You come inside for a minute and I'll show you. Now, the telephone helps us because it lets us know right away when we're needed and how, when, and where we can help people. How would I call the police if I needed them? This poster your uncle made will show you how. We want to use this to show children how to get help. In an emergency, you dial zero to get the telephone operator. Be sure you hear the dial tone first. Remember? Yes, sir. A zero is the last hole on the dial. Now, see? Be sure you bring the dial all the way around to the stop. Then remove your finger and let the dial go back. Now, you dial zero once, and the operator will answer. Then what? Then you say, I want a policeman, please, and the operator will connect you with the police station. Now, when somebody like the sergeant here answers, you tell him who you are, where you are, and why you're calling the police. Police station, Sergeant Evers. My Linda's lost. Oh, that's too bad. May I have your name and address, please? Mrs. Jane Hoskins. Mm-hmm. 42 Barton. And your phone number? 555-1029. How old is Linda? Five. Five? Yes. Where did you see her last? In our front yard. And how long has she been missing? Half hour. And what was she wearing? Pink dress and a yellow sweater, hmm? Yes, sir. All right, Mrs. Hoskins, don't worry. We'll find her and let you know as soon as we do. Oh, hurry. Yes, ma'am. Goodbye. Thanks, Sergeant. Now, see how careful we are to write everything down? Pardon me. Yes, sir. Get out an all-points bulletin. Five-year-old girl lost. Linda Hoskins, last seen on Elm Street. Here's a description. Sarge, this is Officer Jensen, 6th and Elm Street. That's what I'm calling you about. She was all alone, looking in a toy store window. Oh, sure, she's fine. Good work, Officer Jensen. We'll have a car to pick her up right away. See how the telephone helps us do our job? Call Mrs. Hoskins and tell her we found her little girl. Come over here at the window. I want to show you something. There it is, the telephone building. In many ways, it ties the community together. When you dial a number, this equipment inside the telephone building automatically connects you with the person you're calling whether he's across the street or miles and miles away. Thousands and thousands of calls go through here every day. This is Riley's Dairy. We need uh, 50 pounds of butter. 50 pounds of butter. And uh, one crate of large eggs. We'll deliver it today. This is Mrs. Lee, doctor. When can I bring Tommy in for his checkup? Let me see. Uh, how about Tuesday, uh, 4 o'clock? That will be fine. My lady's garage, Joe speaking. This is Les Perkins. My produce truck's broken down. I don't know what's the matter. Well, where are you? Highway 26 near Maple Avenue. Okay, Les, I'll be right out. Lena's mother asked me to stay for lunch. May I? All right, Maria, but be home by 3 o'clock. I will. That shipment gone to Plainview yet? Not yet, Carl. We're loading it now. Good. Listen, Jess, they just called. They want three more cartons of soap. Okay, Carl. But telephone service wouldn't be complete without people to handle special calls and emergencies. Let's hear what the operators are saying. Mr. Hansen, please, long distance calling. I'm sorry, the line is busy. I'll keep trying and call you. Mr. Marco, I'm ready on your call to Honolulu. I'll connect you with the fire department. On your call to Sunnyside, Mr. McCarthy will be back in an hour. Will you talk with anyone else? Thank you.
fire department needs the telephone as much as we do. I'm sure of that. Well, thanks a lot, Captain. Not at all. Thank you for bringing the poster. Have fun, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. It's after 2.30. I wonder where Bobby is. I'm sure he'll be here soon. Like Quacker. Jet plane flies a lot higher and faster than Quacker. Can telephones reach up into the sky? They can and they do. And even more amazing, men are working with communication satellites that orbit the Earth. These satellites can carry telephone messages and television pictures to and from many different parts of the world. And outer space? Yes, Jimmy, outer space too. Man himself has entered space. All systems go A-OK. -okay. Why, it's Mr. Man. Yes. And just think, Jimmy and Susie, someday in the future you may pick up a telephone and soon be talking with your friend, even if he's on the moon. When do we go, Uncle Ben? Pretty soon. Hey, Jimmy! Here he comes. Sorry I'm late, Jimmy. I couldn't find my glove. That's okay, Bobby. Let's go.